coming up on this week's show, a Commodore 64 program in a Christian rock album. Is the analog pocket the handheld we've been waiting for? And we talk handhelds with Elliot from Retro Future and Stuart Ashen. This week's show is brought to you by Harry's. Get started shaving with Harry's today. And The Economist, the smart guide to the forces changing your world. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 196. Your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And welcome to this week's show. Now, uh, we are not long back from... Amiga Germany, our trip out there last weekend. At the beginning of last week's show, we did talk about the fact that we've probably just been there, but we did kind of fake it and record that in advance. Now we do actually feel hungover. Yeah, having been yeah, there for it was the weekend. Amazing <laughs> event. There was thousands of people, and it was yeah. crazy to see. It had this kind of feel of the '90s, but we also um, went to an Oktoberfest party afterwards as well. This was insane. Now, Joe wasn't there. He was working this week, and you're not really into the Amiga. And, no, you know... unfortunately, I'm not massively into the Amiga, so I didn't pop along to this one. But it sounded like they had an absolutely amazing time. This was, that was like stepping back in time. Loads of Amiga fans got together. In this, It was actually a really big museum it was held in, wasn't yeah, it? Like two and, stories. And it was growing. You know, we had a yeah. queue outside. God, I've never been to an Amiga event with a queue. <laughs> <laughs> and there was so much cool new hardware. We saw the Vampire standalone, like a new FPGA interpretation of the Amiga. We saw accelerator cards. We saw guys actually made a, a little device that can speed up your old Amiga 500 and give it better graphics and internet by plugging a Raspberry Pi into it, which yeah. I thought was really cool. But really for me, it was the socializing that I loved as well because you've got a picture of this, all right? We're in this hotel in um, Neuss near Dusseldorf in Germany yeah. and it's got a ski slope in the hotel. <laughs> and it literally, the ski slope leads down to the window of the bar. Yeah. So didn't, all night long. Did went... a drunk guy run up to the top of the ski slope during the middle of the night, jump on a little dinghy and go down it? And then the barman was like, no! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was feeling a bit too energetic. So yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, was that Dan by any chance? <laughs> but then, I mean, he had all those guys, you know, the, the, the Amiga geeks out the back having a nice dinner before it got to that stage of the evening. Then we walked out, and I didn't realise we are actually right in the middle of Oktoberfest, in the middle of this like little area of the hotel, there was a DJ on stage. We went out and there was a full-on rave going on in the yeah, hotel at there like was 9 o'clock at local night. local Germans in lederhosen and everything. It's absolutely crazy. And I'm going to put up a video this week of it. You know, I've just been editing it and getting over the hangover. But actually, <laughs> I've got an event that's happening tomorrow as well, which is at Steel City Chiptune, which is in Meltdown, Sheffield. And this is a really cool Chiptune event. I'm going to be playing from about midnight to 1 o'clock. But we've got Bitshifter there from America, Payne Perdue there from France, um, DJ Formula, of course, uh, Koji, and Harley Likes Music as well. So if you can make it down to Sheffield uh, to Meltdown, it would be a really cool little chiptune event. And obviously you can't see Ravi right now, but you are still wearing your Bavarian Maids costume. Maybe yeah. you're wearing that tomorrow night, Sheffield. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> so, I mean, there's still loads of events going on. Of course, do keep up to date with them on our website at theretrohour.com. We're going to be in Thursk as well in North Yorkshire in a few weeks' time for a big podcast event. So all the details of where we're going to be for the rest of the year and into 2020. Already booking events for next year at theretrohour.com. Now, on the show, we talk about all kinds of systems. One thing that I really think we've been guilty of not having given enough love to is handhelds. Because you know, around the table, we all love handheld systems, but we don't seem to cover them enough on the show. Enough. Yeah, we all grew up with them. We've all, we all own them. We've got them in our collections, but we don't show them enough love, do we? No, no. The last one we had one was a, a Sobe Tech. Yeah. And he was kind of talking about his handheld collections. Well, this week, we've got a new star in the handheld scene and an old classic. <laughs> He'll love that you refer to him as an old classic. So uh, This week, we've got two guests on now. As you mentioned, one of them is a good friend of the show. Stuart Ashen. Ashen's on YouTube. We've had him on several times. Stuart Tall's good value as a guest. And also going to be joined by Elliot Cole. Now, he has a YouTube channel. Only been going him around a year, hasn't he? Well, a couple of years, yeah. but he's absolutely blown up. He's really got some good momentum. And he has this nice vibe that, you know, Ashen's and I think Retro Man Cave and a few other guys have it, where it's kind of therapeutic to watch it. He does repairing and mm -hmm. cleaning videos. Very, like, tech moan as well. He does know. have a therapeutic voice. Ravi pointed that out earlier on, and then we interviewed him, and I was like... He really does. Yeah. Is it AMSR, I think they call it. Oh, yeah, yeah, they do, don't they? Where, yeah. where your face goes all tingly and you get warm. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, let's calm down before we get him on you, yeah, otherwise he might suddenly vanish off the line. That's why uh, I was breathing heavily <laughs> earlier. <laughs> well, this is Elliot Cole from The Retro Future on YouTube. And Ashen's going to get them on this week just to talk about handheld systems. Because, I mean, you're a big fan of the Lynx. 
You yeah, collect for the links. I do collect for the links. I've not got many games for it, but I do have a Lynx one and a Lynx two. Yeah. Um so it's really good to hear from somebody else who's actually a fan of the Lynx and well, Dan's a fan of the Lynx, but somebody else who actually has one. <laughs> well, I, I've got a Lynx two. Okay. So, uh, but mine is um I need it repairing and which we'll, we'll talk about a bit in this interview as well. Because there are like new mods that you can mm, do on the old systems. Yeah. Like mine, I think I don't know whether it needs a recap or a new screen. I can play it. So long as I hold it at about 90 degrees and look at it like kind of on at an angle, then I can play games. That's the perfect game setup. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's not a good look on the train when you're playing your Atari Lynx, I must admit. So we're going to be talking about handhelds and also we're going to touch a bit on toys as well because um, Stuart is actually doing a book all about action figures and rare ones and stuff. So we're going to get a bit nerdy about toys that we used to love back in the day as well. So this is going to be really good. Stuart Ashen and Elliot Cole of the Retro Future coming up on the Retro Hour podcast in around 15 minutes from now. Now, before we get into this week's show, we did mention a couple of weeks ago that, you know, I must admit, I do feel a bit inadequate sat here opposite you guys with your fabulous facial hair. Mine's just, you know, saving money, to be fair. (laughs) Ravi's is styled. Mine's just raggedy. (laughs) (laughs) But it doesn't have to be that way, Joe. It doesn't have to be that way, no. Now, maybe you're clean-shaven like me, which is why it's really good that we've got a brilliant supporter of this week's show. Now, this is our friends at Harry's. Now, I'm usually, I must admit, I generally use, usually use an electric razor. Mm. But I've been trying out Harry's for the last couple of weeks. They sent us some products. I've been trying these out. These are incredible. I, honestly, I've never had such a close shave. Yeah. And, you know, it just does feel a lot nicer. You don't get itchy during the day and everything. I'm a big fan of this. Now, Harry's have got a really interesting story as well. This company is set up by two guys, Jeff and Andy. And we've all seen these, like, adverts and these, you know, membership clubs and that where they're really overpriced. And... They were fed up with paying a fortune for overpriced razors. I mean, you generally go into a shop, often you'll find the razors are cheaper, the blades are really expensive. That's yeah, sometimes it's cheaper just to buy a new razor, yeah. it come, a new actual razor because it comes with two blades. <laughs> so these guys were, were that fed up about that. They actually started their own factory to get wow. around it. That's how dedicated okay. they were. Now, by taking less profit, Harry's offer great quality products for a fair price. Now, these amazing quality blades are almost half the price of the leading five-blade brand. Okay. And we'd like to give you... A trial set. Now, this includes everything you need for a comfortable close shave. I took this away to centre parks with me for a week. And honestly, like I, said, I just felt amazing every day. And you wake up feeling fresh in the yeah, morning. It's really yeah. good. Now, we'd like to give you everything you need to get started shaving with Harry's by claiming a trial set. Forget this, just £3.95. Good, wow. good deal, that is. Absolute really bargain. Really and you can support deal. our podcast by doing this as well. And you'll get your trial set delivered to you, including the razor handle, five blade cartridge, foaming shave gel, and the travel blade cover as well. Now, all you've got to do is open a new tab in your browser right now, head to this website, harrys.com forward slash retro, and get your trial set for just £3.95, an incredible bargain. Help out the Retro Hour podcast by going to harrys.com forward slash retro. And while we're talking about people we love and support this podcast, the Hall of Fame. We do this every week where we welcome in VIPs who support the Retro Hour, allow us to keep doing this every single week for you, almost into our fourth year of doing this podcast now. It's crazy, yeah. And, you know, you guys have really helped with development of the site. You've helped with kind of a a new merchandising shop that we may be opening up soon. You know, (laughs) all of this stuff really helps the podcast grow. And you can support the show by going to theretrohour.com and clicking on support us through any currency through PayPal. Uh, And, you know, it's just fantastic having support from you guys. So... Who's in the Hall of Fame? Well, this week we're going to say a big thank you to Ian R. Wilkinson, Frank Elvin Rundhold, Jerry Dennington, and Joshua Miller, who all made donations to the running of the podcast. And you can do the same, of course, anything we get in the tip jar, all of it 100% will go back into the running of the show, and your help is massively appreciated. TheRetroHour.com and click on Supporters, because obviously we're not far away from episode 200 now. Oh, yeah, special guest coming up. Ooh. You know, people have been asking me, actually, about a few tweets in our Discord, people are like, trying to guess who we've got for episode 200. I don't think anyone's going to guess what it. What are people guessing? Uh, we had AVGN, someone guessed the other day. Okay. I thought it would be good. Someone guessed Clive Sinclair, someone yeah. like All great guests that we'd love yeah, to have yeah. on. Yeah. I think this guest we've got on actually might be even more known around the world. Mm. Let's yeah. see. Yeah, it's an interesting mm. one, actually, because I was really excited about one particular guest. Yes. And then I found out about this other guest. <laughs> and I was just like, wow, that's unbelievable. So Bite your tongue, Joe. I'm biting Bite my your tongue. tongue. <laughs> I'm biting it, that's all I will say. You'll find out in four weeks when we hit the big 200, but trust me, you will not be disappointed. Now, before we get into this week's special guest, of course, which we'll also not be disappointed by because they're brilliant, let's talk about this story that I've been tagged in, probably by about eight people today. 
Because it's just so random. Now, I know, obviously, Joe, you're a massive fan of Christian rock music. Absolutely. Massive, massive, massive fan. I've got a huge, extensive Christian rock vinyl mm-hmm. collection. And often I think to myself, this would be absolutely fantastic if somebody had just put a hidden C64 <laughs> program in one of his rock albums. And I've... Until now, it hasn't happened. Well, you might want to get up there and raid your extensive collection for this Christian rock album, which is called The Electric Eye by a band called Prodigal. That was okay. really good, I imagine, one of your favourites Yeah, as I've well. got more. all, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, it's so sarcastic. <laughs> now, this is really cool, though. This came out 35 years ago. Now, obviously, Christian rock, probably not a preferred genre around the table. Uh, but they've put a Commodore 64 programme hidden in this vinyl. Right. And Secretly c- hidden. Yeah, well, this is, there's a guy called Paul W, who um, he's done this video on YouTube. It's very extensive. It's like near 25 minutes long. But it turns out, kind of in the grooves of it, there's a simple basic program okay. that no one, I don't think, has ever actually documented this running, but there was like this rumor that it was floating around and everything. The way this guy's done it is actually recorded the vinyl to a cassette tape and then loaded it into his Commodore 64 to see what this program had on it. It's crazy. It's only a really short one, but actually it's a basic program containing quotes from Albert Einstein and Jesus Christ. Of course. Um, and then apparently... Einstein, that's a bit weird. <laughs> Sorry. Very random. And then at the end, the, the guy that's actually tracks down the band's guitarist on Facebook to ask a bit of the background about the Easter egg, Easter egg creation as well. So... I mean, you think back to, you know, that kind of era of records. We all heard rumours about hidden messages and records. Yeah. You know, play your vinyl backwards and yeah, you hear this. Yeah. But having a Commodore 64 basic programme hidden in the grooves of the vinyl. It doesn't get more cool. satanic than that, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> this is a Christian rock album, the complete opposite of satanic. Exactly. Joe, so. yeah. This but, is really cool, though. Yeah. I kind of, It's like an Easter egg, isn't it? You know, but with a rock album, you wouldn't get many of those. Yeah, so I mean, the way he's done it is obviously by transferring it to cassette tape, but it's actually a bit of a process because you've got to get the volume kind of pretty much exact for the Commodore 64 yeah. to read it. So yeah. it was a bit of a you know, procedure to get it on there, but... It just made you wonder what other kind of programs are hidden lurking in, like, you know... Maybe there's stuff that hasn't been discovered in strange music genres. I'm going to go back and go through that Christian rock (laughs) collection. (laughs) Hook up your Commodore 64 this weekend. I'm going to, I'm going to. (laughs) Now, one thing that was uh, actually trending on Twitter a bit earlier on this week, um, not the nicest story that we've ever talked about on the podcast, but this is a friend of the show, you know, Octavius Kitten, Sarah who um, does a really good YouTube channel. She's been going a couple of years now and generally focusing on the 8-bit era of computers, Mm, heavily on the spectrum. She does a lot of stuff like that. You know, we met Sarah at shows before. Lovely girl, great conversations. with. I had a few panels with Sarah on as well. But earlier on this week, it was actually um, on Wednesday at the time recording this show, so about a week ago now. I looked on Twitter probably about half past 10 on Wednesday evening and Free Horace and I Stand With Octavius were both trending on the UK Twitter. Okay. Now, the reason this turned out is because Sarah had actually done a couple of videos um, about 18 months ago now where she featured the character of Horace. Yeah. Now, for those who might not be familiar with Horace, um, because, I mean, he was an an early kind of Spectrum mascot, really. Yeah. Before, you know, Jet Set Willy and those games were really big, Horace was kind of like, you know, one of the main characters on the spectrum like um Horace Goes Ski and those kind of games. I must admit never not games that any of us around the table really played before. You know, we weren't massive spectrum gamers. But she kind of used him in a couple of videos as a bit of a parody. But then her videos got copyright striked and her channel almost got deleted. Well she was worried because yeah. she got two strikes on her channel and then... You get three, you're gone aren't you? you get three, you're gone basically. Yeah. And that was her only source of income but mm. also every single intro she had Horace in. Yeah. So nearly every video she had to make private. And this was really interesting. It turned out that um, a guy, Paul Andrews... Yeah, uh, he's got a company called Subvert. Subvert had actually purchased the IP. Yeah, He decided that he didn't like the manner of which Horace was being presented, so then went to YouTube and these claims happened, which, yeah. uh, you know, I think if if maybe they'd talk to each other before or something then this this would have uh, been hopefully resolved you know but it's an interesting idea isn't it somebody buys an ip of an old video of an old video game character or something then goes through all the old videos 
takes them down because they then own that property. It's uh. which to me is that's the main point of this. I mean, yeah, I felt really bad for Sarah, and like, I think you know they've sorted it out now in some way. Yeah. You know, they have been talking since. I mean, I think she's got the strikes removed. As yeah, well, so. I mean, oh, the, the spectrum. I didn't know that. Well, the okay. spectrum Facebook groups blew up, and like you know, the, some of the moderators quit because you know, yeah. well, they yeah, deal so with it c- yeah. comments from all sides were yeah. pretty grim, to be honest. People threatening to burn down his studio, stuff yeah. like this, which obviously you know you yeah. can't, can't endorse that. No. Um, but it, it, you do make an interesting point there because, I mean, I'd think with stuff like that, you'd assume using an old video game character will kind of come under parody law. I mean, I, I, I left a comment in one of these groups now saying, you know, you look at AVGN and yeah. he has like Batman and the Joker and Bugs Bunny and that in his videos. Yeah, you know, characters uh, playing them. You know, so. I think it's the size of the person. So if you look at South Park, they have... Last week, they had every single Disney character on there. Mm. It was Buzz Lightyear, all of these guys yeah, going to yeah, China. Yeah. You have Mickey Mouse shooting people and Winnie the Pooh getting <laughs> <laughs> killed, you know. But that South Park, they've got a huge team of lawyers. Yeah. And, you know, compare that to a, a small individual YouTuber that's just putting content out there and you're getting Google doing this as yeah. well, you know. Yeah, they're, it, they're acting like the middleman. It's, it's 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 a scary kind of precedent to set, I think. Mm. Yeah, it's a messy situation as well because you'd imagine that come under parody law, but the thing is the copyright strike procedure in YouTube's automated. So yeah. then they've got to look at it and assess it and everything. And like you said, you know, for someone who has a YouTube channel with a few, you know, tens of thousands of su- subscribers who hasn't had this happen before, it does make you overly cautious, I think. And that's a, the situation I don't want to see. Because I imagine now Horace is probably the, the YouTube coverage that, I think they're bringing out a new Horace game, which yeah. is actually really bad timing for this. Because now everyone's going to be scared to cover it, I think. But, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think it's done him no favours, no. you know, uh, with, with that brand. If you'd kind of just left it or if you'd had a word rather than going for the kind of yeah. brutal takedown style. But then I think also... But then, at the same time, if a Horace game came out out of the blue two weeks ago, would people be talking about it? Whereas now, if it comes out, are mm. people going to be talking about it? But I also think YouTube seems to me to always fall in favour of the copyright. Whoever makes the person, you know, and it is very hard to appeal these things. Yeah. That's that's what I think. YouTube automatically, if it's with bots scanning stuff or anything, you know, they'll always be, oh, he's the copyright owner. I put a song up, Monty on the Run, mm. by Rob Hubbard. This German band claimed that they did it. <laughs> I was like, no, Rob Hubbard did it. I counterclaimed, still haven't got the actual oh, really? claim through. Yeah, you could ring so... Rob Hubbard and get him to talk yeah, to you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, there is a much bigger conversation around it, yeah, but I think, you know, yeah, stuff like that, it just proves people need to, you know, they shouldn't just go for the brutal approach and they need to, you know, talk about these kind of things. But it is scary, though, because it makes you think the amount of, you know, I've got a lot of videos that with, like, you know, music and, and or if games. That's, and, if that's someone's yeah. sole income as well, you yeah. Know? Yeah, yeah, scary situation. I'm glad it's kind of got resolved now and hopefully Sarah's videos are all starting to come back on the channel now. Uh, we wish her luck with that. Now, let's talk about another story, a bit more positive, that's been everywhere this week. Everyone seems to be very excited about this uh, <laughs> new handheld, the Analog Pocket. Oh, yes, this looks absolutely gorgeous. And if you know the guys from Analog, yeah. nearly every product they've put out now has just been absolutely perfect and really highly rated by the community. Um, this looks interesting. It's... Uh, Handheld unit, it looks really sexy actually. That's going to play Game Gear, Neo Geo, Pocket, Atari Lynx, and other, oh, obviously Game Boy, Game Boy Color. And Game o- Boy's the main thing, isn't it? Yeah, Game other Boy. handheld stuff. But um, So it's physically going to be able to play Game Boy cartridges. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. one of the most interesting things. But then it's, but that's the only cartridge it's going to play. Is it original Game Boy and Game Boy Color and Game Boy Advance, or is it just original Game Boy? Uh, Game Boy, Game Boy Color, Game Boy Advance. That's cool. Yeah. That's really cool. But then. With the links, etc., is that going to be emulation? That's going to be an adapter oh, that, you really? get, that you put in that will oh, then fantastic. play the original carts. And okay. The thing about this is, you know, the NT stuff has always been pretty expensive. Yeah. But from what I've seen, it's really been worth the price. And it's also got Bluetooth inside, which is really interesting. So you can get your little Bluetooth controllers, adapt yeah. them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really interesting. I didn't realise it was going to be an actual hardware adapter. So just pretty cool. And Elliot does actually mention it in the interview yeah, yeah. Uh, later on in the show. And they've got a dock as well. Yeah, and he, he speaks about the dock as well. But apparently he's watched some videos about where they've researched the... Uh, the actual chips and they're not actually making a huge amount of profit on this so the cost of it is actually justifiable apparently yeah and you know it's 
it's like if you really want to get this high end experience, I think mm. the analog pro- products are really worth it. Yeah. From what I've seen, I don't know about this one yet. But, well, that's the thing. Yeah. I mean, there's not really many. I mean, we we often see like little like kind of software emulation mm. handheld clones and stuff. But actually, having something like this, I think it's FPGA based. So mm. it's I mean, it's essentially you know physical hardware programmed onto a chip. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's much higher level than emulation. Yeah. yeah. But. You don't often see these kind of dedicated devices that, again, will play the original cartridges and are made to this quality that are kind of targeted at the handheld market. So I think that's very cool. And there's no release date for this yet. Apparently, it's going to be out, you know, any day now, hopefully before Christmas. So we'll keep an eye on that. But I think it does kind of inspire confidence that analog products have always been high quality. Yeah, and it's got a kind of sideloading feature as well. So you can have a micro SD card yeah. put into there, load up ROMs on it as well. And it's got USB uh, abilities. So maybe in the future... You know, we might get duck on it. Something crazy <laughs> like that. Doom. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if you're a dodgy pirate like Ravi, I'm sure you'll find a way around it. Now, while we're recording the show, obviously, you know what's coming up next week. Are you feeling nervous? I didn't know what that was then. <laughs> Brexit. In my ears. <laughs> well, of course, it is the spookiest night of the year. Halloween's coming up next week. I was about to say my wife's birthday. Want <laughs> <laughs> well, some more sound effects about this one? He loves That's his like, sound effects, right. doesn't he, he does. Dan? He does. I, thought, I honestly didn't know what that was. It tickled my ear. I was like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Anything to give you pleasure, Joe. All the time. Now, obviously Halloween's coming up, and it's a night we like to you know, sit in maybe when it's cold outside and werewolves are howling in the distance. Maybe sit down with the lights dimmed and the glow of your pumpkin nearby, playing some of your favourite horror video games. Actually, no, I'll get rid of that. Actually, no, <laughs> so you've been posting, you did say this, every day on your Instagram. Yeah, on scary my Instagram, games. I've been doing uh, a horror game or a horror-themed game every day. Yeah. Um, it's going pretty well, actually. I've not missed a day so far, which is pretty cool. Uh, raiding my game my game collection, looking for stuff. But we've got, actually, an interesting feed here. Uh, the top 10 or just 10 kind of spooky games to play on Halloween. Now, this is on uh, PCMag.com. Yeah. And there's actually a really good list here. Because, I mean, I often, I like playing, like, Christmas games at Christmas. And yeah. Halloween games. I mean, there's not that many, though. <laughs> and, like, I'm yeah. looking at this list and I'm like, actually, I've forgotten about it. But also, you like to take the mick out of some of these lists because usually they're pretty badly done. But this one seems really good, actually. Right. they got Alone yeah. in the Dark in yeah. there. You know what? It's not got the kind of general go-to. For me, it's always Resident Evil. Yeah, I always yeah. go play Resident Evil. Um, but, yeah, it's good to see number one straight away being Splatterhouse yes that was a huge game and you, you know yeah. I, I, I read old comics and the amount of advertising for Splatterhouse was yeah, absolutely yeah. crazy so you know they've got 10 they've got Luigi's Mansion on here well you know they're talking about Splatterhouse I mentioned it's a TurboGrafx-16 version they're talking about I always remember that on the Mega Drive that was yeah, the number platform two's on the Mega Drive yeah yeah, yeah. so they're on about the TurboGrafx-16 version number two for the Mega Drive is probably a little bit easier to get a hold of yeah. these days um, but ha- yeah. Haunted House on the Atari 2600. Haunted House on the Atari 2600. Well. Grabbed by the Ghoulies on the original Xbox. I'd forgotten about that. That was a really good game, actually, Grabbed by the Ghoulies. Yeah. Luigi's yeah. Mansion as well. That, that was Mansion. a great hit one. Alone in the Dark, Ravi mentioned a minute ago. Um, but what I want to hear is what would your two's go to spooky game be? Well, I think, yeah, Alone in the Dark, I always play. Yeah. That, cause, I mean, that's on this list here, and they do make a really good point. You know, they're talking about the fact that it does feel very primitive today. Yeah. So, Alone the Dark came out in 1993, yeah. so it predated Resident Evil. Yeah. And it was tank controls. It does take me about 10 or 15 minutes to get used to the controls yeah. of the game. Um, but when I'm into it again, it is a really atmospheric game. And I think the reason that it reminds me so much of Halloween is I remember that being featured for the first time on... It must have been the 1993 Bad Influence Halloween special. Ah, okay. And Violet Berlin was there with the glowing pumpkins. <laughs> well, <laughs> talking about that again. for me, it's Dark Seed. And I'd totally forgotten about Dark Seed, which was, uh, you know, H.R. Geiger who did the Here alien it is again. Stuff. <laughs> oh, you're scaring me now. No, H.R. Geiger who did the alien yeah, yeah. Uh, stuff. He'd actually done this horror point and click. And it's like insane. It's a psychological nightmare where he gets a seed implanted into his head. We yeah. actually and spoke about Dark Seed on the first ever episode I was on. Yeah. Because it had just been re released for like uh, AOS. Absolutely <laughs> amazing game. And because it's a point and click and you're kind of looking around and it gets really creepy. Yeah, yeah. There's this one bit where you uh, get a knock on the door and you open it and there's a there's a baby in a, in a, in a thing, uh, like a little skeleton baby. Yeah. <laughs> Really scary game. Really scary. I want to get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Another one on this list as well. I'd forgotten about, but I did actually like this game. Escape from Monster Manor 
on the 3DO, oh, which is yeah, not a title yeah, actually yeah. listed in these kind of lists yeah. very often. I'm not familiar with this one, funny enough. This is actually one of the best FPS games on the 3DO. Yeah, um, so, that's not hard. Yeah, <laughs> not that many, to be fair. And they've got Blood Omen as well, Legacy of Kane on the PlayStation. And I see Halloween is always... I, I think it's getting bigger every year now, isn't it? And I love AVGN often does like a Halloween kind yeah. of special, doesn't he? He does yeah. a lot of these games as well. So it is one of my favourite holidays. And there is a bit of room for, you know, Call of Duty Zombies. Got to play that oh, yeah, every Halloween absolutely. as well. So I'm going to put this on our Facebook, actually. If you've got any good recommendations for spooky games to play in Halloween, let us know on our Facebook page, Retro Hour UK. I'll put it on our Twitter and Instagram as well. Well, we're talking about Luigi's Mansion, actually, number three is out next week on Halloween. Yeah, it is, oh, isn't it, for the Switch? Yeah. yeah. And I've just seen here, actually, Tetris 99 is getting a uh, Luigi's Mansion 3 theme to go with that as well on Halloween. So, <laughs> if you're into that game. I've still not played Tetris 99. I've still not got that Switch. Joe. I know, I know. I do want to get it. But yeah, that looks pretty cool. Well, if you're a very good boy, Santa's coming in a couple of months. Yes, so, he is. <laughs> now, before we get into our chat this week about handhelds, talking about the Switch, making Joe even more jealous. Have you seen this story about the US military now? We, we, we've, we've, <laughs> Sorry, we've, we've I've just seen the picture of this photo uh, of this US military story. Go ahead, Dan. But God, this, d- describe this, the picture. What do, you, what do you see? So this is um, uh, an American military uh, lady. She's pulling out a floppy disk, but uh, this isn't like 3.5 inch. This, no, is, this is like, like a 7-inch. <laughs> this, this is an 8-inch floppy eight disk. 8-inch yeah. floppy Every inch counts when you're talking about this. There we go. So, yeah, I mean, we, we did cover it again, another story that we covered very early on. I mean, it was um, when they discovered that a lot of these kind of <laughs> nuclear rocket launchers and stuff yeah. were running on these old computers from the 60s and 70s. But now it turns out, apparently they're finally going to retire floppy disks to coordinate <laughs> nuke launches. So these were floppy disks that would store the coordinates. So they probably didn't need much information, if you think about it. It's just the numbers, isn't it? Yeah, uh, yeah it's just li- numbers. The launch codes, I imagine. Yeah. Uh, yeah, or even where it's going to point, you know. Important information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't want yeah. that to get corrupted. Maybe actual... you get a disk error. <laughs> so, from, so from reading it, they they contained the the they received the nuclear launch orders from the president. So as Ravi said, it would just be the coordinates. It'd just be the numbers. I I've, I've seen war games. I know how it yeah, works. Yeah, we know how it works. <laughs> but that's absolutely crazy. So what, do you think they're going to just have USB sticks now? <laughs> well, yeah, apparently they're getting rid of this. And they're saying, though, it's not going to be connected to the internet. Yeah, good Which idea. could be a very, very yeah. bad thing. Not the kind of thing you want to make open yeah, to hackers. Yeah. Um, but what are they replacing this with? Well, I, I guess they're going to need some kind of hardware solution because well, that's I, what this I've, is. You know, I've heard the rumor about how the U.S. Air Force used a hundred PS3s. No, no, that was apparently Saddam bought like oh, hundreds of PS3, uh, PS2s, networked them up for. He had a plan to, but it never worked. Oh, no, I, I thought, think you're. I had the PS3s as the PS3s well. well PS3s using, yeah, the, the military. I think they the used military, to say US they military. could be used for nuclear submarines or something, but that was a bit of a like Sony. Um, Oh, I you know, know, promotion. I, it's that be, powerful. We could be somebody. Somebody reach out to me and let me and Dan know if that actually happened. The PS3s with the uh, the US military, but yeah, it'd be interesting to see what they're going to use now. Maybe they're going to use PS4s. <laughs> <laughs> it is a mini disc. <laughs> yeah, <a> mini disc <laughs> player. <laughs> it is always, you know. In a way, I look at this and I think if it's not broken, don't fix it. Because mm. it's not the kind of thing you really want to mess around with. I don't think yeah. it, if it, you know, just leave it be. You know, it's a <laughs> yeah. it, you know? And especially if it's not connected to the internet, it's yeah. safe then. I mean, it? they're talking about here in the article, they don't really specify what's going to replace it, but apparently it's going to be a highly secure solid state digital solution. Whatever. Yeah, probably a USB yeah, stick. Yeah. Like <laughs> <laughs> if you want to read more about that, we'll put all the information and all the things we talked about this week in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, before we get into our chat all about handhelds with Stuart Ashen and Elliot Cole from The Retro Future, let's give a huge thank you to a dear friend of ours and a massive supporter of The Retro Hour podcast. And this is, of course, our very good friends at The Economist. Now, we are really proud to have The Economist as a supporter of The Retro Hour. They've been a trusted source of intelligence here in Britain for over 170 years. And in this age that we live in now, focusing on essential information and sifting through all that noise that we see out there in social media, every time you open your Facebook feed, every time you look on Twitter and websites as well, it's a time now when facts matter more than ever. And they let you know what is happening in the world around you. Now, The Economist do more than just, you know, economics and finance. They cover stuff like world politics, business, science, technology, the arts, video games. And every week on the show... We look for a good story in The Economist that we found really interesting this week. Now, we've been looking at the revival of vinyl. Yes, so this is the strange revival of vinyl records. And basically what they're saying is, as kind of CD sales are going down, 
vinyls going up. And it's now actually replaced CD sales, exceeded them for the first time since 1986. They're saying it still only accounts for 4% of the whole record market. And like Spotify and streaming services are about 62% of the industry's revenue. But, you know, that's absolutely crazy that CDs have kind of just disappeared and vinyls now (laughs) took the place. You you wouldn't think that would happen. You'd think maybe Blu-rays or some kind of higher definition audio format would do it. But no, people love collecting their physical vinyls and products. If someone said that 30 years ago, that in the year 2019, vinyl would outsell CDs, it'd have been like, no way. What are you on about? Yeah, (laughs) what happened to those nuclear floppy disks? Did they go off? (laughs) But I mean, I actually did get my my Technus 1210 turntables out the weekend. You did, I saw that on Facebook. And it's great. I mean, the the feel of vinyl under your hand, there is just something about it. there's so many people that regretted selling their collections back then. Just like game collections. But it's fetching a lot of money as well, vinyl these days. So, I mean, this is kind of stuff you can keep up to date within The Economist. And we'd actually like to give you your own free print copy of The Economist. And again, like vinyl, there's something very tactile about having a physical product, you know. Reading stuff on websites all well and good, but having a, fr- a print copy of The Economist in your hand, it's just something about it, I think, the gravitas of having a printed publication. So we'd like to give you your own free copy of it. And of course, you'll be helping out the podcast by doing this. So if you live in the UK, do this right now, get your phone and text the word retro and send it to 78070. We've arranged it so you'll get your own free print copy of The Economist through your door on us. All you've got to do is text retro and send it to 78070 with The Economist, the smart guide to the forces changing your world. Right, we'll have more news on next week's show. Right now, let's talk about handhelds from back in the day, classic toys as well. This week's interview is so interesting. Stuart Ashens and Elliot Cole. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast and it is time to welcome on this week's very special guests because we do have two amazing guests joining us this week. Let's say hello to Stuart Ashens, good friend of the show, and Elliot from the Retro Future. Welcome to the show, guys. Hello. Hello, thank you very much. Great to have you both on. Now, we'll start with you, Elliot, because I mean, it's the first time you've been on the Retro Hour. Um, it is. What's kind of your background with, with game Zanks? I mean, I'm sure a lot of our audience watch your channel, but what, what kind of started it all off for you? So... Oh, I don't know really where to start with this. I think when I was um, probably 14 or a little bit younger than that, I watched this channel called Retro Game Tech, which is a a UK guy called Martin, who actually unfortunately does not upload a lot anymore. And I've always had Game Boys throughout my life. I think it's just probably a more affordable console than some of the other ones. And I never really played a lot of home console games at all. And yeah, just always had consoles, picked up a few of the older ones, I guess, like the DMG and stuff. I always had a Game Boy Pocket and a Game Boy Advance. And then Martin just got me into cleaning them. And I've literally got weird videos of me recording my me cleaning old Game Boys on my DSi when I'm like 15. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> that's pretty much it. And I've always liked making videos as well. So the, the two kind of came together. And now I have a YouTube channel called The Retro Future. Well, you're from Jersey as well. And is there much of a kind of gaming scene in Jersey? Other than bingo for the OAPs, not really. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, are you like a local celeb then? Because I, I know you've been in the paper and... Uh... Um, no, I don't think... I think that's a very strong word. I'm not a local celebrity. <laughs> <laughs> We've got like Henry Cavill, who played Superman, who lives in Jersey, and, and a lot of rich football managers who live over here as well. So, so uh, what was the worst handheld you've ever experienced and why, Elliot? Well, you see, this is a sort of a, a difficult question for me to answer, and I'm sure Stuart would agree. The Mega Duck, there's so many awful handhelds, like seriously a lot of, and there's, they're actually still making awful ones today. If you go onto eBay and AliExpress and type in Game Boy, there's just a, an absolute plethora of, of handhelds that you can buy, which are all dreadful. Um, but if I was to talk about a non-modern one, it's not just trying to copy everything else, I'd say it'd probably be the Gamate or the Game Master. Uh, So the Game Master is meant to sort of be like a Game Boy knockoff, but I guess it sort of looks more like a Game Gear because it's in that landscape orientation. But the screen resolution is diabolical. It's probably about a quarter of what's in the actual Game Boy, the DMG Game Boy. All of the games are are terrible. They sort of try and copy the, the Game Boy's games, but with the less screen pixels just makes it even harder to actually contemplate what's going on on the screen the d-pad oh my god the d-pad Stuart. so this is the also called the systema 2000 isn't it 
which yeah, is the name. The yeah, that's the name I always do it by. Um, yeah. So the D-pad, uh, like all good D-pads, is inexplicably at like a 45-degree angle stuck on the side almost. Yeah. Um, so for people with hands that just grew out of their face one day, that's really useful. But for humans... <laughs> Not so great. The, really, the problem with it is, I mean, you may remember the old Game Boy screens being quite blurry when things are in motion. Oh, yeah. This basically just turns to smoke when it moves. <laughs> it, and she's almost entirely unplayable. But other than that, it's the greatest console ever made. I mean, in terms of your channel, Stuart, I remember you did a video about the Atari Lynx. And, um, you know, that, that original Lynx, that massive one that looks like a big paddle, you showing that off as yeah. well. I mean, are you a fan of the Lynx then? Did you think that I was a good I the Lynx. I, I absolutely love the Lynx. I have a complete collection of Lynx games. That's actually a bit of a lie. I discovered the other day one of them's missing. I need to get another copy of NFL bloody football because it's just gone for some reason but yeah absolutely loved the links back in the day and a few years ago well quite a few years ago now the game seemed to lose all value so i just bought them up and um, now got a complete collection and now the games have got value again so hopefully i can retire on copies of rampage blue lightning and warbirds have you done one of the uh, the, the mods yet the McWill LCD mod to the Lynx. I have not, because I don't mind the Lynx's screen. It has sort of the best screen of that era, and there, there's some nostalgia to it for me in that. Uh, Unlike enough, the Game yeah. Gear, which needs to be thrown off a cliff because the screens are just awful. I actually do have one of the mods for that with an LCD thing in it, because you just... Yeah. Uh, yeah, they have um, just like backlight kits that you can sort of pop in there, which goes behind the screen, if I'm thinking of the right thing. Are they a pain not... to fit? I've, I've seen like... YouTube videos and little people taking about three like, hours the, to fit them. Or the Game Boy ones, you have to scrape the foil off yeah, the front yeah. and do all this kind of biverting. Oh, yeah, I love that. Um, uh, do you feel that if you replace the screens and stuff, you're kind of ruining the original system, or do you think it's actually worth it? I think I think there's. I personally think there's enough of them out there. I mean, it depends if you're a if you're a purist collector or if you're a game enthusiast. You know, a game playing enthusiasts but i don't think we need to worry just yet about you know backlighting game boys i don't think they're exactly so hard to come by that it's just a, a awful awful thing to be caught doing i think it's all right <laughs> no, I, I totally agree with that if it's something where there's a lot of um copies still out in the wild and my god there's a lot of game gears and there's a lot of Lynxes and there's a million game boys that's all fine i mean if it's something that's like borderline museum piece then you know please don't pull it apart and replace it with stuff but um i really want to backlight a mega duck but <laughs> oh, the <laughs> dream i know it would be lovely how interesting has it been for you, Stuart, to see Elliot's channel rise? Because I remember you were telling us you were kind of submitting MP4 videos to websites. Before, this was long before YouTube. <laughs> oh, this is before MP4s. It was uh, uploading WMVs. Oh, wow. Yes, to, <laughs> so, uh, you know, you upload files.net or whatever, yeah. I mean, those days, even when YouTube was new, there was no thought of it even being ever monetized in any way, shape or form, you know. I just thought maybe I'd get like a writing job off the back of it and do something, you know, a couple of bits with the BBC or something. Um, whereas the sort of direct, this is your channel and it makes you money thing was uh, almost unthinkable, frankly. Um, it really did spring up out of nowhere and create this uh, new sector, I suppose which they now call influencers because they like horrible words. <laughs> that doesn't make me cringe every time I hear that word. Oh, it's yeah. awful. Isn't it? I think it's mostly a sort of uh, old media thing of making all the new stuff sound in some way, I don't know, surface level and not actually of any value. <laughs> Influencer, that's all that really matters is they mess with the minds of the children. <laughs> Influ it's actually a negative con connotation with the state of YouTube today, really. Would yeah, you really but... want anyone being influenced by half of the dross that you find? <laughs> in Until I've seen every child in this country putting Mentos into Diet Coke, I will not. <laughs> well, do you think um, one thing I, you know has always struck me is that Nintendo obviously dominate the handheld world, and they kind of always have. Why do you think Nintendo get it right when other companies kind of fall by the wayside? I so think are you referring to like the PlayStation and stuff? Or? Uh, yeah. hand handhelds, yeah, in terms of like... Yeah, like kind of like the Switch coming through the DS against stuff like the Vita and even um, yeah, Xbox's yeah. new plans for a, a, a handheld. I've seen a few pictures of mock-ups. Well, you even look back in the day, you know, the, the Game Boy was technically inferior to the Lynx and the Game Gear, but, you know, it's, it didn't sell, <laughs> those combined didn't sell anywhere near the Game Boy's units. The Game Boy, for sure, the Game Boy was, was just down to the library. Mm -hmm. It was... Um, 
you know, by no means was it a superior handheld in terms of its technical specification. The Game Gear and the Lynx both blew the Game Boy out of the water with its capabilities. You know, the Lynx was backlit in color about 10 years before Nintendo could get there. Um, but I think, I think today that's still really sort of relevant with Nintendo. I mean, most of the consoles that Sony were making were very, very, very advanced. You know, you look at the, the PlayStation, the PS Vita and the, and the PSP. Um, and I don't really think that there was a massive market for that. I think Nintendo have always targeted a, a sort of a younger audience. I know that there are a lot of games that, you know, played by people of all ages. In fact, there was a brilliant video uploaded onto YouTube of this this lady who's in like 87 or something who played Animal Crossing every day for like four years before her DS broke. So, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I think... Um, with that, obviously, parents are buying their, you know, children the consoles. The children then want the games, and having a younger audience, which, you know, has sort of, which sort of drives the the console's success. I think that's really where Nintendo won. I mean, at least that's what what I believe. That is not really a researched opinion. That's just, you know, me going off of what I feel. But I think that's pretty much why they succeeded so much because it wasn't anything to do with price i don't think because everything pretty much cost the same the games and the consoles but yeah definitely the games library i mean certainly in the early days the game boy was a bit cheaper but um it wasn't yeah i think it was down to as you say the library which was just absolutely blew the others uh, away but also the game boy was the only one that was really portable in a true, true. sense yeah yeah because i mean the batteries in the game gear lasted I think about it had the same sort of half-life as one of those weird elements you find along the bottom of the periodic table. You know, <laughs> you, you put the batteries in and they were dead slightly before the batteries were made. Um, and the Lynx, again, not exactly fantastic. You'd get a bit more life out of the Lynx if you had that ridiculous battery pack that's like the size of your liver and weighs as much as four full-grown bull elephants. But, um, <laughs> yeah, the, the fact that you could literally put the Game Boy in your giant anorak pocket and then play it to wherever, play it in the car for much longer than you could for the Game Gear or whatever. Was... Especially the Game Boy Pocket as well. That was Oh, yes. Well, I mean, that made such a big difference, didn't it? And the Game Boy Color as well, both fantastic batteries. Yeah, yeah. Such a shame that the Switch has such a short battery life for what it is. Mm. But uh, there we are. They want the power and the portability these days. So know, as it's... someone who's always like quite into tech specs, I remember as a kid you like seeing the Lynx and seeing the Game Gear and thinking, why would anyone want a Game Boy? You know, because th- these are so much better systems. There's colour on them, and the, the games look like arcade games. I could never figure it out. But look at uh, something like Double Dragon on the Lynx, which isn't the most amazing version when you play it, but the graphics are like exactly like the arcade. Mm. Admittedly, one of the sprites takes up the entire screen because it's a much lower resolution, but the, the principle of it is you see the screenshot and, oh my God. And I mean, compare that to, you know, the Game Boy thing. But again, it comes down to the fact that Double Dragon on the Game Boy is probably more fun than it actually is on the Lynx. So, you know, it's, it's this thing of if you're into your games, you're going to want everything so you can play all the games. But um, the Game Boy's actual you know, portability and massive library being supported by everything. And then in the late stages of it, Pokemon comes along and becomes like this massive juggernaut, which keeps the interest going in it. And yeah, they certainly did very well. Let's put it that way. It's interesting that I was kind of finding in the world of people modifying games systems now a lot more people want to make portable versions of things so the dreamcast was like the portable dreamcast oh, and of God, course yes. you've got the um spectrum vega as well which was an interesting project but um do you think we're going to see more of these kind of portable versions of big consoles i think that's a possibility there's been a lot of talk on this recently and i, I th- yeah i wouldn't be surprised especially as things like um raspberry pi zero is becoming so small and things like the perfect example the gpi case from retro flag we put a raspberry pi zero in it it looks exactly like a game boy except it has six buttons and you can play mega drive games and nintendo games whatsoever on it and at some point people are going to look at that and say i want a piece of this pie and i am nintendo and something will happen along those lines although having said that Nintendo are keen on pushing um, you buying all the games singly again on the Switch. So perhaps financially, from their point of view, that's that. 
I know the Sega are, are doing the same, but also Sega have released various handheld consoles in the past through the tremendous Superhumans at Games, who oh my God. created the most <laughs> wonderful handhelds in history. I think they've damaged <laughs> Sega's reputation more than Sega themselves. I think they honestly massively have hindered. So How many of those things did at Games make? They never even it's got the sound. Tragic. Did you hear about the uh, the camcorder Sega? I mean, what is the point? They just made like a camera and thought, let's put a couple Mega Drive games in it, and then they branded it as a Mega Drive camera. <laughs> I've heard of that I, one. I, I, yeah. did wa- I did want one, though, I must admit. <laughs> <laughs> there was like a... a I've, there's one of these in my local CEX at the moment. It's like a um, gimbal thing that you put your phone in, and it clamps it on, but underneath it is a Sega Saturn controller. What? <laughs> and, and apparently you can, like, download... Um, a couple of games, and from what I can tell on the box, none of them oh. are actually Saturn games. It's all oh, like yeah, I've Mega Drive, yeah. Sonic, and Dreamcast Crazy Taxi. But yeah, I've always uh, thought about picking one of those up, but always very skeptical about whether they actually work or not. Um, which actually segues very, really nicely into the next question about uh, craziest add-ons. Um, you guys so mentioned the um, the battery pack for the Lynx earlier, but what other crazy add-ons have you guys come across in your uh, adventures? The Lynx also had a um, sunscreen visor. Oh, it's wow. Just a bit of plastic that you put over <laughs> it and gave it its own little cocoon so you could, you know, look at it in the sunlight easier, which actually was pretty useful. I had a friend who had one. Um, some of the original Game Boy stuff is amazing. The Booster Boy, which oh, yeah. turns your Game Boy into like a giant lozenge with an uncontrollable joystick that sticks to a table and has like massive lenses and god knows what coming off it um the handy boy that was one to make it slightly too big to actually use properly um i can never remember the name of one of them where you just slotted the game boy in and it was like an arcade machine but that one wasn't bad actually and, and the buttons oh, kind of came down yeah, and pressed yeah, the buttons yeah. on the game boy yeah. yes yeah, i do remember yeah. that thing the wondrous one had some absolutely phenomenal um add-ons for it there was a um, you know the little hex bugs things that operate off of like vibration. Mm. They they had one for that, and you could actually control it, the little bug with the Wondrous one. And I believe you had to build the bug yourself. There was also like a pocket sonar that was there was also <laughs> that was also released on the Game Boy actually. But you could fish using your Wondrous one and your yeah. You could go Game three Boy. meters down with it or something, couldn't you? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> imagine <laughs> seeing a little crazy. carp or something on the screen of a Game Boy and then. Like what? I don't know. I don't know what they were thinking with that. And there's also um, there's there's a terrific amount of which I didn't actually really realise. The Wonder Swan was obviously used, or at least they um, Bandai wanted it to be used by like businessmen because the amount of like mobile add-ons for it in order to make it like a a little portable organizer, it's just ridiculous. The Wonder Swan was so successful in Japan. It sucks that there isn't an English library of wonders one games because there is really is some beautiful games for the wonders one that's something we don't see anymore isn't it pdas i was working at pc world years ago and they were getting rid of an xda which was like a you know palm piloty sort of thing um like a pda with a built-in phone <laughs> so it's, it was like a smartphone <laughs> slightly before smartphones but it was like this massive chunk and no part of it was integrated properly it was the most oh awful thing um but i thought it was cool for at least 12 minutes then i sold it well you guys also seem to have this fascination with lcd games tiger games and we all used to get stuff like that when we were kids i was wondering do you have any interest in tamagotchis as well because that was one thing that i used to really be into i had a tamagotchi i don't know what happened to that but i think the idea of like you know i'd I'd go to school Um, because I was in school at the time that the Tamagotchi was the rave. And I would ask my mum to make sure to feed my Tamagotchi. And then I think, like, one day I probably just had this realisation of how ridiculous that whole concept was. (laughs) My dad. put it down and never used it again. And I think... He's now gone to university and had several children, that Tamagotchi. So, uh, <laughs> well, well my, dad was, uh, <laughs> my dad was a university lecturer, and during the middle of his lecture, his Tamagotchi went off and he had to stop it and go, Sorry, I've just got to feed my virtual pet. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> They're actually re releasing them now. They come about about every 10 years, don't they? Yeah. And they're just like, it's usually Bandai, funny enough, who's trying to push them out again. <laughs> they're, they're pretty advanced, though, now. I mean, because obviously technology has just gotten so advanced and so cheap that 
they are, I actually might give one another go, you know. I'll, I'll give it a little whirl, see what it's like. Hey, there's a video in that. Yeah. <laughs> 100%. Um, what's both your guys' opinions on the Tiger.com? Cam, Tiger uh, Gamecom. Oh, the game. The game yeah, com. sorry, the yes. Gamecom. My God, that was a... Th- that's another screen that doesn't <laughs> quite do the job of actually being visible to the naked eye. What are you on about? That's the best screen known to mankind. <laughs> if that was true, we'd all be just living in caves. But, um, man, the, the, the game that came with it, you pretty much, when you start moving, can no longer see him. He goes yeah. invisible. <laughs> it's, it's absolutely accurate, yeah. Which is brilliant. They had such weird games. There's a version of Duke Nukem out for it and stuff like that. And I don't mean like the Sonic old platformer. Yeah. Oh, my God, there was a Sonic game, wasn't it? Yeah, imagine Sonic the Hedgehog yeah. on a game with, with ghosting. Do you know I might on still a have a copy ghosting. somewhere? There's it's, Resident it's... Evil 2 on it as well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Or perhaps the best game of all time, Lights Out. Oh, well, at least you could play that on the screen. Yeah. <laughs> it, it didn't just like blur away to nothing like Sonic did, you know. Yeah. I think I've got Wheel of Fortune for it as well, which is the oh, other playable game. game on the system. Yeah. God, that was. I've, a, got, oh. I've got it in a box actually, but I I used it for a video, and something. I mean, you can sometimes you can look past the bad screen. Sometimes it's, it's only in very small amounts of circumstances but the actual build quality of the game.com itself is just so so awful it's so light and the back is so flat it's just <laughs> awful the whole thing it is like a big just they got a big brick of plastic and just slapped it a few times with the chisel and there you are jobs there are good go. and you know <laughs> you know talking about tiger electronics i remember being a kid and like my mum getting me uh, you know the uh, the outrun game they released I loved Outrun on the arcades, and she got. Oh, I've, got I've got you a version at home. Got it for Christmas. And those <laughs> games, they were like the worst thing ever. But you couldn't offend your mum. You had to display them. But oh yeah, thanks, mum. They released some shockers, though, didn't they? they? They released one which literally sits in like a sort of dashboard, a ridiculously futuristic and non, um, well, non Ferrari looking dashboard because it's actually a Batmobile. They just made a Batmobile one years before. Um, reuse the mould and then just change the Batmobile front of it to the front of a Ferrari <laughs> and obviously change the graphics of the game they weren't quite that bad but yeah oh, their afterburner machine is a thing of absolute horror they're always kind of great at recreating doing cheap clones of like the latest technology and um, I was wondering do you think we'll see future technologies like uh, foldable lcd screen tiger games and uh, maybe a tiger <laughs> version of siri who knows when the chinese manufacturers work out how to um produce sort of copies of stuff very cheap you'll be seeing all sorts of bizarre things i mean if you go on aliexpress or wish now and search for retro games the amount of bizarre things you can find hey it looks like an arcade machine with two screens and two sides it's two machines stuck together is it has it got yeah, a Pandora's crazy. box in it? Is it full of ghosts? Nobody knows. And they're it's all so too expensive to try out. Yeah. I, I, I'm in this predicament with my channel where there's a demand for people who want to, who would like to educate themselves on the on the newest handheld console emulating devices, and everyone, you know, China, China are just bashing them out so quickly now that. You know, we just had the release of this thing called the RG350, which I haven't even got in yet, but they're getting so expensive. It's about £75 now for this little thing. And they really don't seem that different to the first ones which are coming out, like the Dingu A320, oh, which honestly... It's... Stuart, you made a video on that thing like 10 years ago. I did. And we really haven't actually come <laughs> very far from that. And the, and the prices are still ridiculously high, yet we've now got... Yep foldable lcd screens and macbooks that are thinner than an atom and it's just like when are china actually going to step up their game i said it boom <laughs> <laughs> oh my god they're on twist we're doomed Don't mention um, to bed. Ah. and i want to get like snes as a standard now because i've had enough of the nes famiclone crappy oh. handles i mean how many designs of that have we got now it's actually painful that's that's getting ridiculous. I mean, me and Elliot were talking about this like a month back, but there's there's just millions of the bloody things. They've all got the same knockoff NES ROMs in them. And that menu music. It's literally People that. Like, it's like, oh, Ashens, do some more pop stations and stuff. Sorry, guys, they have gone. Everything is now just bloody Famiclones, you oh. know. 
I've not even deliberately ever got hold of one. I must have ten in a drawer here. I think I sent you about five of them because I couldn't sell this them. Most of your fault. Yes. <laughs> I didn't want to sell them because I'm just going to lose money on PayPal, and then they weren't. They're bad, but they're not that bad that they deserve to go in the bin. So I just thought, right, I'll send them to Stuart. It'll be his problem now. This is the problem. They're just sort of crappy, but not really bad enough to be funny. I know, yeah. All I think that the they are, in a, in a way, although some of them are deceivingly expensive, some of them, you know, you'll, you'll look at it and you'll, you'll think online that actually that has potential. You turn it on, you get about 0.3 seconds before the menu music comes on and you realise it's another family clone. But um, they are actually decent because you can buy them now for about three pounds. You can get if you just type in. I don't what? really endorse these things, but yeah, if you type in Game Boy into eBay, one of the first thing that comes up is a, a little fake Game Boy thing with like the Supreme logo on it because that will sell more of them. And uh, they are <laughs> Not actually, the Supremes that would sell. <laughs> they are actually decent. Like for you know, if you're on a, on a long haul flight or a train or something like that, and you just want to you know look through the menu and have spend sort of 10 minutes on each game and there's 300 games in them so that you can't really fault them but yeah it's the price of a sandwich yeah you wouldn't have to make any it profit is, on yeah. that that's and crazy he's not lying as well the top one has the supreme logo on it <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, i've just checked that it's a sub really it didn't yeah you? absolutely incredible <laughs> there you go so what do you guys uh, think of the new analog pocket that was announced this week i'm excited Mm. Yeah, these guys seem to know what they're doing, and it's looking really good. But but who knows until it's released? Although the dock thing, I mean, whose idea was that? The dock is is like a hundred more pounds, and considering the thing itself is like two hundred and something, whose idea was the dock? What does it? What purpose does it add other than just to sell? I don't know. I just I don't really agree with that. I think. That was a little bit of a stupid idea, but the uh, yeah, the analog pocket itself does look good. I I'm excited to hear more about it. Um, I just hope that it isn't bad. I'm worried though because analog are sort of renowned for not emulating software. They're sort of more hardware emulating, and they actually do use some very expensive um, components. I was watching, uh, I think it was a This Does Not Compute video. Uh, Colin, shout out to him, he's a legend. Um, and he was he took the thing apart and inside it, he um, saw the chip that they were using. And then I think he went and try, t- tried to find like their tr- the trade price of those chips. And there's actually not a massive amount of profit in analogs pro- in products. But what does worry me is the fact that they are advertising this thing as being able to play you know, Game Gear and Lynx and all of that sort of stuff. How are they going to fit all of that in? I reckon they're going to have to sacrifice their hardware emulation and have a little bit of software emulation, which could make this thing just tragic. I think, you know, don't don't shoot too far. Just sort of reel it in and make it a beautiful Game Boy. Don't, I don't reckon we need to be doing everything on one device. I, I've never, ever had a desire to to just switch from one console to another in such a short lifespan that it needs to be on the same console. I don't know, maybe that's me, but um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it though, regardless. Yeah, um, I think they, they've kind of said that it's got Nano Loop on it as well, which is like the music making software, and that usually bashes the kind of Game Boy uh, hardware pretty well. So maybe the Game Boy side of it's like perfect and then the I other ones might yeah, be. I think the Game Boy side of it is actual hardware emulation but then the Lynx and the um, Neo Geo Pocket and the Game Gear I think the adapters they're going to you know supply for those they're probably going to contain some sort of software emulation stuff and mm, we'll see it so. might it might floor it it might do yeah uh, they're not going to be able to fit hardware emulation into into the design form factor that they've gone for not in not for five different handhelds. There's no way. It's a F- FPGA, FPGA based. based. Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah. yeah. See, I don't know enough about FPGA to make any sort of comment on that. So I'm going to top, stop talking now. Bye. <laughs> well, I think it's essentially you can just like flash like a certain custom chip or a CPU onto like an FPGA. But yeah, you couldn't have like loads of different variants. But, but then wouldn't you have to have the same sound chip? So you'd have yeah, to have yeah. you know the hardware would have to relate to the other. Yeah, I guess. they're just so good at doing what they do that it does because. Um, it was D- Dan, um, Daniel Libertson, he was doing a, like a live stream and he is like the biggest Mega Drive fan that is literally known to mankind. And he said now that he's stopped playing his Mega Drive and he's just playing the analog 
N T or what, what, what? I don't know what they yeah. call that actually. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. But um, yeah, and he said that everything down to the sound, the everything is just so perfect, which excites me because I'm a huge fan of the Game Boy. So I am very excited. I just hope they don't make it so expensive because they claim it can do everything under the sun, and then all the other things just turn out to be really crappy and gimmicky. But we'll just have to wait and see. Well, recently, Ellie, I saw that you did a um, Sony Walkman repair video. Is that yes. like an area that you uh, want to move into, like retro audio? Does that interest you? Uh, I think I'm just weird. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I just, I, uh, I listened to, I watched this film um, called Quicksilver, mm. which is a 1970 or early 80s film with Kevin Bacon in it. And the the soundtrack to that film is just amazing. And I bought the cassettes because cassettes are just pittance nowadays and um then i wanted a sports walkman because they were the rave back in the day and so yeah i fixed it but i have actually been doing um not to you know cramp on your fact check but i have actually been doing some walkman videos for probably the best part of about a year i did the a, a repair on the tpsl2 which is the first um walkman that sony did make and uh yeah that that's a, a beautiful little thing See, I was um, chatting to a friend of mine who lives in Dubai recently, and they've started selling, actually, and uh, they've got, like, Virgin Records are still out there. But they actually have a section where they started selling new cassette tape albums. Yeah, uh, a lot of artists are actually releasing um, cassettes. I bought a George Ezra cassette, Staying at Tomorrow's, his newest album. Um, Sam, Sean Mendes, sorry, he released his. Um, yeah, there's quite a few people actually releasing cassettes. Bon, bon Iver, he releases a lot of cassettes. I don't know why, really, because... Well, Gaming Muso, there we go. He released his <laughs> yes. um, yeah. guitar stuff on a cassette. I think it's probably because it's a very inexpensive medium. Um, because it's... Well, actually, it's probably more expensive than CD, actually, but yeah. Oh, yeah, con- considerably, yeah. There's yeah. a lot more to it, and obviously not produced in the same quantities. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know, I think it's a, it's a beautiful physical way of of owning um some music and i i definitely feel like it's less i don't know robotic and dead when i'm listening to a cassette you can hear the whirring in some cases you can feel the mechanics sort of moving and i mean i'm a i've i'm an absolute music um i love music to pieces i've always always been involved in music and yeah i really like it and i think that combined with my love with handheld technology, the Walkman was just such a cool thing that I just, yeah, really wanted to d- dive back into. You know, you know, it's bizarre though because I remember, you know, vinyl. I can see the appeal of vinyl coming back. So, you know, it, it had that kind of warm analog feel. But I remember, you know, I couldn't wait to get off tapes when mini disc came along. I was like, finally, something that doesn't hiss in the background. And it's I was weird. exactly yeah. the same, mostly, yeah. especially because you could like you can skip tracks really quickly and not have to fast forward through the bloody things. You yeah. can do that on good Walkmans. <laughs> Sony released a, a bunch of Walkmans actually in the '90s um, and early 2000s even that are really cheap to get today. And you can skip tracks. They're pretty much the same size as a cassette tape. They've got literally nothing in it other than a paper thin motherboard. And uh, yeah, with with a good pair of headphones, those things have like Dolby noise reduction from you know like one of the highest end ones of those. And some good headphones, you cannot tell the difference between a Walkman and a phone. Well, crazily, I, I've just I didn't have the money for those. Do you know what I've got <laughs> behind me? Don't get too jealous. A Morphe Richards Playtime, which is a cheap Walkman with built-in swappable LCD games. Oh, those <laughs> things are actually really cool. I've I've wanted to get one of those for a little while, actually. When I've reviewed it, I'll throw it in the bin to spite you. How's that? Oh, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> well, I, I've just actually read an article, which was from the um, National Audio Company, where they're saying there's a worldwide shortage of a... Gamma ferric oxide for cassette tapes at the moment because so many are being oh. produced. Oh, ah, really? Oh, God. This is, this is our fault with our Morphe <laughs> Richards playtime. Uh oh. <laughs> what have we done, guys? We're just going to have to release everything in the future on mini disc and wax cylinder. It's going to be the next global crisis, I can see it. Yeah. <laughs> yes, mini, yes. mini disc, in my opinion, trying to get back into like retro. Well, not really. Mini disc isn't even that old, but um, going into sort of, you know, to different sort of dead formats if you will mini discs are a nightmare because the mini disc walkman players all operate off of t- tiny little lasers as do all disc things and they're all broken 
they're all burnt out and you can you can turn them them up for a little bit so that they last another week and then that's it it's gone whereas with walkman it's just replace the belt give it a clean you're off well speaking of uh Morphe Richards uh, players, etc. <laughs> hopefully, <laughs> hopefully. I'm um, excited for this thing, right? Well, hopefully, um, you'll be getting one in the post after this from a fan, because uh, you guys get a lot of stuff in the post. Is there anything else exciting you've received recently? I actually closed the PO box years ago. Oh, okay. Um, because yeah, it's just too much stuff going to it. People are very kind, but I couldn't deal with the sheer amount of things. I went away on holiday, and a friend said, "Oh, I'll look after it," and yeah, it like. He almost had a breakdown. Um, <laughs> like two days in, he was sending me a message saying, um, "It's like, this is literally ruining my life. It's now taking up one room of my house. And I'm like, I hadn't actually realised how severe this had gotten. It's that sort of boiling frog thing of when it slowly ramps up, you don't notice so much. But um, I did have, I do still technically have a PO box, but it is a secret one, which I occasionally tell people. And somebody did send me a very nice box of um various bits and bobs recently he said he was just going to send an old hamley's toy catalog from the 70s which he did but it was also in like a big plastic box all these lovely things and gifts it was like christmas but 20 times better there was all knockoff street fighter figures and 2000 ad comics and ah uh, it was wonderful if you are listening to this thank you mr person for sending that in it was really nice i was sent a uh from a guy called I don't know why. Why did I try to remember his name? Oh God, this is awful. Um, I, basically, he sent me a oh Paul. That's his name, Paul. He sent me a N-Gage, a Nokia N-Gage. No way. Despite the fact that the N-Gage is not fantastic, it was an absolutely bloody lovely gift, um, and a bunch of games, some of which were actually sealed. He also sent me a Gizmondo. Oh, uh, oh they're getting rarer, and they're yeah. all melting. <laughs> I actually did a video uh, showing removing that sticky finish. Um, and yeah, what a what a bloody present! It turned out that Gizmondo was a development unit as well, wow. and it came Ooh. with some development CDs, and uh, that is now sat in my friend John's house because he has an obsession for development kits, and it's on display, being appreciated. And uh, yeah, I mean that was that was the most mind blowing thing that's ever been sent into my. Box. The, the, en- the engage was a really weird. Dev- I remember my friend Paul had an engage back in the day, and like, when you saw him speaking Is on it, it the as same a phone, Paul? <laughs> <laughs> it might be actually. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the interesting thing is at the bottom of our notes we've got Gizmondo and Nokia engage written in capital letters in bold. <laughs> so I'm starting to think like this is really weird. Not many people had the engage, and I don't think there's many pools in the world. So it must be the same one. But, but you remember, don't quote me on that fact. Trying to talk on that like a phone, you looked ridiculous. It was like talking in. To a Game Boy, so it just looked no, it was a did console. That, really? It, it, did I they used to walk down the street. A phone? Yeah, I was there embarrassed. Was a website with called Side Talking, where there were just people, <laughs> pictures of people like holding ice cream sandwiches to their ear and that kind of thing. <laughs> and they the stopped it when the QD first. was released. Yeah, because the QD yeah. is spoken to normally. But they nicknamed it the Tucko because it's just like this yeah. massive triangular wedge of plastic. Yet it has a quite a decent joypad on it. It is actually good. Yeah. It is good. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've I've literally got one in my hands as I'm speaking because for logistical reasons I for some reason have two engages on my desk at the moment. But um, I do kind of miss the, the playing games on that little thing there. Although there's only like two decent games for it: a shoot 'em up whose name I can't remember and a really good billiards game. And that's pretty much it. There's a version of Tomb Raider you can play in portrait mode because you're loony. Um, oh my god, Tomb Raider on the N-Gage. Don't even yeah. get I get awful flashbacks. <laughs> didn't, they have really, so didn't they have really aggressive advertising? Or was that like the Gizmondo? If you paid for one version, you could get one just full of adverts. And then if you paid a premium <laughs> price, you get one without adverts. Did they do that for the N-Gage? I'm not sure. But the, the Giz, uh, bloody Gizmondo, Gizmondo. was it? Oh yeah, yeah. smart ads. Yeah, yeah. You could get. They one never even ads. released the smart ads, did they? No, they didn't. <laughs> so they bought a much cheaper one because they were going to send ads to it, and they never actually sent any ads. But I mean, the Gizmondo is insane, isn't it? If you look in, it was more a sort of money more money laundering, money laundering project than actually an attempt to bring a games console out. It's absolutely bizarre. I what? love the story of the, who is it who did a really good video on that. Um, the story of the Gizmondo gaming historian. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's it's absolutely. It's just a train wreck. It's it was so. Funny. Wasn't it f- partly funded by like the Swedish mafia as well, or something like that? Something like that. Literally yeah. so, I believe. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. 
the um the CEO had like ties with the with the mafia. Oh, it's brilliant. I love the story of that. Well, Stuart, you, you mentioned something about, you know, when you said the Hamleys catalogue, then I, I kind of remember, you know, as a kid when you got the Argos catalogue, and even now, looking through, like, you know, web, there are actually websites that archive old, like, Case catalogues and um, Argos and stuff from back in the 80s and 90s, and there's something very nostalgic about not only going through the, the video game sections, but also the looking at the old hi-fis and the televisions and that kind of thing. That That's an experience that you don't get anymore, going through catalogues, isn't it, and looking at them. That's such a serious nostalgia hit mm. for so many people of our generation, I think, you would just sit there with the Argus catalogue looking at all the toys you'll never be able to afford like that bloody Dark Tower board game that yeah. <laughs> um, cost like £76 in 1987 so of course nobody ever had it you know um, Jersey I've doesn't got... have an Argos <gasps> no way yeah but where do you buy your whatever people buy from Argos these days <laughs> um, there's just this guy called Dave just like <laughs> Dave got. Now we've got what's called Bambola. I'm not sure if that's a chain. Is there a Bambola? Bambola? In... No. And we had 101 one toys. 101 toys. Yeah. I think all our, our, our Argos have moved into Sainsbury's now. I think around here. Did you have? Do you have 101 toys? Is that a thing? No. Mm. Yeah. Is, is that just how many toys are on the island, or is that the name? <laughs> <laughs> I think mean, that's how many toys have ever existed in Jersey. There's there's not many people in Jersey. No. Um, 101 toys was. Um, yeah, that that was my go-to toy shop. Also, upstairs in Woolworths, they had a massive um, toy section up there. Although, rest in peace, Woolworths. That is not no longer in Jersey either. Um, I've just looked up Bambola, and apparently, it's a 1996 French-Spanish-Italian erotic melodrama film. So uh... maybe type in Bambola Jersey. It's called yeah. Bambola Toy Master. Bambola. To- oh, it's part of Toy Master. Right, Toy Master. I understand. I'm just going to yeah. that, mark that film for later. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's a good little toy yeah. shop. There's, there's two of them in Jersey. I'll give them that. There is two of them. That's it's, the it's only place sh- to get toys now in Jersey. Well, this it's happened here, isn't it, where there's so few physical toy shops these days. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Such a shame because, you know, where do you take your kids to act up these days? It's just <laughs> not the same as it used to be. There's no Toys R Us is there, which is, you know, the big one. There's no um, – in fact, there's, there's kind of nothing is there. There's the local chains. Um, we've got a Toy Master shop called Langley's in Norwich, which does some bits and bits. Oh, right, so it's Toy Master. Uh... Yes, it's like a weird sort of semi-chain which sort of – it has shops s- yeah yeah that's my right. understanding of it i think the only ones we've got left as chains are the entertainer and smith oh Talks. we've got an entertainer i completely uh, forgot about that. isn't it like heavily driven by religion and so they don't sell i mean let's not get into this on a podcast but they, <laughs> they don't sell like a lot of toys like no harry potter toys because witchcraft and oh, really really yeah, yeah. I, I worked there as a on Saturday job about four or five years ago. Um, and then I lost the will to live, so I had to leave that. <laughs> but yeah, um, I I remember them. Well, first of all, they didn't open on Sundays, which obviously not a lot of, no shops in Jersey do. And then they didn't open in any special days leading up to Christmas. Um, because, yeah, even on a Sunday, because obviously that is the day of rest. And then there was no Harry Potter toys because of the witchcraft. They they didn't promote Halloween. That's interesting. I remember hearing that um, because the one in Nottingham didn't open around Christmas at all and it was a big thing about it because people were like, where are we meant to get our <laughs> our children's magic kits, um, ironically? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the time of year you want a toy shop open as well, yeah. isn't it? Little it's... Billy wants his 12-inch Satan action figure. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. You know, you know, actually, it always makes me sad, though, now, talking about these shops that are not around anymore. Does it make you upset when you see the shell of old shops, like, you know, an old Blockbuster that's abandoned or a Toys R Us oh. with the logo? still there it's oh, something quite heartbreaking big, about that oh big toys are us near my office and it's heartbreaking mm. it I is just bargain as they were shutting down actually i bought like a game boy advance for like two pounds good god yeah all i can remember is a million copies of various fifa games uh, which yeah. i mean they were only selling for like 50p anyway and now they've gone down to like 44 of a fennig or something <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So, Stuart, you've actually produced two great books in the past. Do you have any more planned? I do. Three, indeed. We, we, three uh, great books. For, oh, well, my apologies. <laughs> three. Yeah. Two, two great books and a visual joke, yeah. Um, <laughs> 50,000 Shades of Grey. Yes, yeah, it's quite literal. Um, yeah, we're doing a th- going to be getting to work properly on a third book probably early next year. I'm co-writing with somebody else this time, and it's going to be on weird old action figures. 
so we, we've been going through all the just some of the archive stuff is astonishing they made so many teenage mutant ninja turtles figures oh, it's yeah. unbelievable and by the end of it it was like weird tie-ins like farmer donatello what? what does anybody really need that firefighting Star- transforming Star- donatello i have that one. i always wanted that <laughs> oh, oh, yes it literally turns into a fire engine doesn't it yeah but what, yeah. what, why? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I know, a question which was never asked in their office. And yeah. I know the Ken are real Ghostbusters toys as well, and there's so many of those that you never saw in the cartoon or anything. And they were, you know, you wondered, like, do we really need like a tenth range of toys that you've never seen in comics or cartoons? There was some amazing stuff for that real Ghostbusters yeah. line. Things like the um, Haunted Neighbourhood, whatever it was called. Um, that's, I can't remember the proper term, but that's going to annoy me. But you had things like Granny Gross, yeah. which is like an old lady with eyeballs coming out of her hat and a whole front of her body opens up into a giant mouth. And the know. policeman as well, well, I remember. He was quite scary. I had the policeman. Yeah. I had the uh, the binman who turned into an insect. Yes. Oh, <laughs> it's like a mantis with like, wings coming out. Yeah. And Fearsome Flush, of course, the toilet that comes to life and draws a bright your house. And we had like a, I, it's like a purple I was kind of, um, 10 years later. a purple kind of <laughs> goblin thing. And adds, you put like sparks, like caps in it and run it across the floor, I remember as well. I was also born 10 years later, but I have an older brother. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's the most bootlegged, look at me podcasting. Um, what's the most bootlegged toy range? Like, you know, what was the most sort of... Oh, Star Wars. Star Wars? Star Wars? It's got to be Star Wars, yeah. yeah absolutely. The, what's next after Star, the Star Wars? Because that's quite an obvious one. Ooh, hoo, hoo, there's a question. Um, E-Man, maybe? Hmm. Might be Ninja Turtles, I don't think. Yeah, a, there was a lot of them back in the day. Hence why so many were made. They oh, besides them. Lego, actually. That was mm. a, that's a pretty obvious. Yeah, so it's not really action figures. Yeah. Is oh, yeah, yeah, kind yeah. of is, really, I suppose, isn't it? Um, just with a lot of bricks as well. Yeah, I'm not actually sure. Um because the sheer amount of knockoffs made in you know Mexico, um, China, etc., when yeah. any new thing came out, maybe it's just... Toy Story. Like maybe because there's a heck of a lot. Oh, of Oh yeah, oh fake... millions. Does do millions? millions. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just, I've seen a million bizarre fake ones. I've got some where they're like done up like Captain America and stuff, which I'm pretty sure is not an official license. That could maybe be a good little extra page in the book. You know, just like the top ten most bootlegged lines of. Um, action figures or something that'd be interesting well good luck with the research on that one (laughs) yeah i was gonna say that's gonna my god we've got a lot of them but yeah you start looking at things like the star wars figures where by the end of it they were getting so desperate for characters to produce there's just really bizarre things that no child ever wants like the 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 woman who dancer with six breasts from Jabba's palace who you see in the background for two seconds like (laughs) canteen man three yes yeah I think they're up to like seventeen, but <laughs> isn't there a, isn't there one just called Peanut Man, and you literally see him in the first one for two seconds in the background? <laughs> I'm not aware of Peanut Man. There's something <laughs> mental like that. There's Yak Face. Um, That's it, Yak Face yeah, or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. There's there's so many of them, and yeah, it's it's a funny puppet they put together. You see, I've got a seconds. really cool book here actually, which I was um, clearing out my garage because we moved a little while ago. And uh, it's a pop-up Star Wars book from, I think, the 80s. And it's all about Jabba's um, palace and the, the little adventure that C-3PO and um, R2-D2 had. In, and it's a really cool book, actually. And it's got like sound effects and stuff. You might Ooh. be interested in it. Sound effects? Yeah, they do. They have, John, like, that's, little, um... that's some futuristic stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's an electronic... Although, God, I haven't actually checked the battery in there. That might be... That might be too far gone, but it's a cool little book, actually. It is quite cool. Well, oh. would you guys kind of plan on collabing in the future or maybe, you know, contributing to one of Stuart's books? God, no. No, I'm joking. I'd love to. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is you, you live in uh, lovely, lovely expensive land while I'm stuck up in Norfolk somewhere, so we need to um, physically get together at some stage. Yeah, well, we obviously we did a little uh, a little video together in YouTube space about... How long ago was that now? That was a year. Plus. Yeah, must have been a year, 18 months. Yeah, something like that. I have a lot of people who, who ask to to do collab with um, with Stuart, but I think it's because we cross over slightly, in, and that's actually thanks to you, um, in the obsession with obscure sort of handouts. Um, but when I do videos on that, I get a lot of your viewers sort of on the in the comment section saying, 
we should get together with Stuart or why are you copying Stuart's content? You know, those sorts of things. <laughs> yes. Only Stuart may review a thing. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody else must ever speak of it, apparently. Yes. Um, yeah, we totally need to do this. Mainly, I need to get you to my house so you can just repair all my stuff. While I, I yeah, that would be good because I always need stuff to repair. But I have I have repaired your uh, Systema 2000. That is Oh, is that up and running now? That is. I, I that swapped that for a Hartung Game Master. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why These are real so words, funny. people. We're not making this up. <laughs> no. and I, you know, the, the game master. I did not realize this. This is only a, co- a conversation that you and I want to talk about. But the uh, the game master. There's so many different variants of the game master. I have a. I have two different purple ones. One of which is called the Game Tronic, and then one's just called. You ready for it? Super Game. <laughs> and then. Uh, <laughs> And then, yeah, they're all made by different companies. It's like they see a, a company saw a failing console and they thought, right, let's have a crack at this. They bought it, failed as well. Brilliant. The, the kids will buy anything. <laughs> so they thought. Yeah, and how wrong they were. <laughs> went fast. Yeah. Well, guys, it's been amazing catching up talking about, you know, handhelds. I love the toy conversation as well. I think, you know, we, we should maybe do like a toy expo or something and like have a panel with you guys. That'd be a great laugh. Well, I'm always up for talking about action figures. Yeah. <laughs> When's the book going to be asked, Stuart? You got like an ETF? I have for it? absolutely no idea. Um, we haven't got seriously into writing yet. I've got a lot of research notes and bits and bobs and quite a few of the figures we need to photograph. Then we're going to have to start asking collectors, please, sir, can we photograph your weird action figure? And all that kind of thing to actually, because I want the book to be quite a visual one because it's all very nice talking about the history of things. But when you're saying this thing looks weird, you need a good photo of it. I mean, that's like the basic thing, isn't it? Um, so in answer to your question, I don't know. There's some sort of a auction going on at the moment. I heard on the radio today of like 3,000 Star Wars action figures or something going under the hammer. I don't know. That might be completely wrong. Star Wouldn't Wars. surprise me. There's a lot of stuff being found all the time on that. Um, I could probably afford none of them. <laughs> so I'm just going to sit here with my knockoff Lego figure that's supposed to look like Blanca from Street Fighter 2. Don't even look at that auction. <laughs> no, nope, just, nope, just going to look at Blanca. Um, <laughs> well, guys, it's been a pleasure having you both. We should do this again. It's been lots of fun. Thank you. Absolutely. Give me. us a shout. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, keep up the good work. Cheers. Lovely.